in the last uh, 1700 or even 1500 years that that we saw the complete and final desertification of uh, North Africa. And, you know, up until then, it it, it reduced and reduced down to what we see today. But uh, 5,000, 6,000 and 7,000 years ago, it was a fertile and magnificent place. So the argument is that somehow people who lived in paradise felt compelled to organize themselves to have even more. That people that lived in relative comfort somehow found the reason defying all history of human behavior to be motivated to work extra hard in building a civilization. Now, of course, I'm being sarcastic, and the reason I'm being sarcastic is to highlight the absurdity of it. There is a golden rule and the golden rule has never changed. Necessity is the mother of invention. Necessity. If unless you have to change, you do not change. Now that's not that we are stupid. That means we're intelligent. It means that if we're living in comfort, we don't change. So change came quickest in those areas of uh, of people that were facing annihilation. And guess where people facing annihilation occurred quicker? Yep, they occurred quicker in those areas where the hunter-gatherers had been literally cut off through the melting of of, uh, ice and melting of, uh, and the rising of the seas. They were cut off uh, that they had lost their normal staple food and they were facing absolute, utter annihilation. And the first place that occurred was in Ireland, and the second place that occurred was the island of Britain. And so my argument is, and there is certainly evidence to suggest this, which is hidden, the first gold into Europe has been proven, absolutely proven without a shadow of a doubt, came from Ireland. And yet this is not included in any of the history books, even though it's fact. The first gold minted into Europe was from Ireland. And the first gold appeared to have a religious connection. So if you want to see how civilization emerged, it appears that those that survived the great ravages in in the nomadics and were forced into a different way of thinking, then gained something and that thinking was religion a sense of something more. And what they exported was the spark then into these places and then it was religion into places like Turkey that then was the spark of civilization. Not grain, not organized settlement, but because giving something to people more than simply eating and having babies and killing one another was the spark. And the founders of religion, the Adam from what I can see, were the Holly, the Kulian, the first priests, and they came from Ireland and Britain. Wow, very interesting. Thank you, Frank. Uh, well, we are getting late. I wasn't wanted, wanted to make sure we still have a little bit more time. There's a couple of more, couple more good questions and a couple more folks on the phones. How much more time do you have tonight? Yeah, look, let's go for uh, another 10 minutes and then um, then I think we'll do a wrap. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry if we haven't covered all the, the comments, uh, but there have been yeah. some pretty big questions. So. <laughs> yes, there has. And it's, it's been a, a lot of participation tonight. So, so uh, yeah. next question. Um, are there any remedies in Anglo-Saxon law that can be used in the current system or that supersede it and, and would be recognized? That is an absolutely fantastic question. And the reason it's fantastic, and I'm not going to give a long-winded answer, but the reason it's fantastic, two things come to mind. The first is we've all been blindsided by the image training us to say common law. And of course, I said to you, common law is privileges, it's not rights. So we've been looking at the wrong place. If you look at the wrong place, you never see the, the right answer. And so what we've been reading is all their fictional history and all their rubbish. The second is there hasn't been enough 
real research into Anglo-Saxon back to Charlemagne and what they really, really did and, and what was there. So I'm sure there is remedy that we haven't yet fully realised. I, I know that there is remedy in terms of the concept of lease, which was invented under Anglo-Saxon law, and the right of redemption that was invented under Anglo-Saxon law, and elocution that was invented under Anglo-Saxon or were refined under Anglo-Saxon law. So the more that we can get to the pure of this, and I know it's there, I think it's just buried and ignored because people are focusing on the image training they give us rather than on the real thing that underpins it. So when we get through that, I'm sure we're going to find that there is remedy and, and real remedy. I've mentioned some. But our research on this is is far from over. So the answer is yes. Are we there yet? No, I don't think we're 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 on top of that yet at all. So uh, basically, then Anglo-Saxon law can it be considered the inalienable right or unalienable yes. right? Okay. It, you are absolutely right. When we speak of the rights that we see as uh, inalienable, immutable, we are talking about Anglo-Saxon law. When we are trying to make a connection between, and I say, as I mentioned this earlier, between Jesus, Christianity, and then where we find ourselves today, the bridge is Anglo-Saxon law. It is not common law. So yes, that is the source and we unfortunately have been image trained to look the wrong way and to define it the wrong way so when we get our head around the right way hopefully we will start to bring to light the nuggets of uh of insight that are embedded and are there but have just been depreciated like i, I mentioned elocution has been depreciated to the point that if if someone went to elocution today and looked at it they would have no idea the importance of it because, of course, it's written as a non as a a non issue. Yep, great. Thank you, Frank. Uh, let's see. What laws did the Queen promise to defend in her coronation oath? Well, that's an excellent question too. <laughs> Uh, well, some would argue that that anything she promised, because she made an oath on a on a forged, well, on a non-real uh, uh, scone stone, whatever she promised was was uh, a fraud anyway. Um, look, she uh, she promised to uphold certain uh, rules and certain office, and uh, what those rules are and what those offices are are themselves very vague. So. Uh, I guess the answer is uh, it's not really clear what she promises to uphold. Uh, she performs multiple roles. She holds multiple persons. Uh, but, you know, what she does and where she is, you know, it remains a mystery. I keep seeing new things come to light about the role of the Queen and the multiple roles that she holds every week. So I can't give you a definitive answer. Um, it's 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 an unfolding thing. Rome is ultimately who she serves. The Roman system and the Vatican and the Roman cult is who she serves. And this idea that she is the head of the Protestant Church and the Protestant Church is the enemy of Rome. Look, I hope people now have got over that myth and that image training and that lie. Look at what took place with the Pope and the Queen. Look at what's taken place with the Church of England effectively saying we're prepared to come back into Rome. I hope people realise that what we were taught and what our parents were taught, what our ancestors were taught, that the Protestants were the the true, true church and that they were fighting against the tyranny of Rome, that was all sadly, and I mean the word sadly, sadly a big fat lie. And it was hiding a system which was really a pure system built by the Jesuits. And that's what we're talking about in the cognitive law. So I'm not saying the people that believed it were wrong, or not wrong, sorry, that, that, that they were disingenuous. I'm just saying that the, the thing that we were promised turned out not to be 
what it is and the present history in the last even the last four months has shone a light on just how much that was a myth hmm. well uh, yeah very true thank you all right darwin came back on with a question darwin can you hear us yeah good day thanks uh frank um I'll, I'll just uh, this last question I'll, I'll, it's slightly into what you've been discussing. I just wanted to know if you're familiar with tribal law of the Indigenous people of Australia. Uh, little pieces of it. Uh, I wish I knew more. Little pieces of it. But um, I, I would say one thing if I could. Um, and I wanted, I would like to know more, but I would say one thing, and this is my, my last thing, Darwin, and thank you for coming on. But if I just wrap up with this one thing. Can I, can I just add to the question a little bit before you wrap yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, please, go, go for it. Yeah, yeah, go. I, well, I, just, I just base it on, on, on the, 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 the basis that my understanding is that you're neutralising argument based on providence or, or precedent or understanding of interpretations of what they're claiming to be law. Yes, and, I um, am not highly literate or very well read, but of of known people who have been, and my understanding is that uh, our tribal law here in this nation precedes all written memorandum law. Now, yes, yes, it does. They, yes, it does. Now they they have recorded history in in geometrical form yep in, in written tablet yep in spoken word in dance yep and that law improves our understanding of biblical law or precedent or our understanding of what we believe to be the providence of what we're interpreting, because I agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now I just because I'm, 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 we're, we're unfortunately at the very, very end of time, Darwin, which is the only reason I sound a bit urgent on the on the phone. So, if I can just wrap up and and thank you, and if you've got more to say, please keep it because I don't want to diminish anything you've said tonight. But I just want to add one thing to this as proof of what you're saying in the truth. I can offer this. And I did say this to a, to a, a I was I was honoured to meet a, a fellow that uh, had the title of uh, of a, a Jagamanka, uh, so as a, as an elder, and uh, and when we spoke and when we met face to face, I said for all that I know on Eucadia, there is a uh, a a people in the Indigenous of Australia that base their culture on this truth. That life is a dream, but a dream has rules. Hence, oh. they spoke of their connection in dream time. And I said, if there was one thing I wished to show all Indigenous people in Australia as a healing, it is that their ancestors were right. That it was more than simply stories and songs. It was a knowledge and wisdom that transcends time, that they were right. And if they could start life with that understanding, it would change them and indeed it would help all of us better understand the, the incredible wonder in our connection between this world and uh, the universe. So I want to leave it with that, uh, if I could. Uh, I know you've probably got other things to say, but if I leave that with you tonight, it, it is, is that sharing of, of a meeting I had with, with an elder with the title, uh, with the honourable title of a, of a Jaga, Jagamanka, Jagamanka, but to say that uh, that the ancestors were right because life is a dream and a dream has rules. Thanks, and I hopefully you'll hear from you again next time. Yes, thank you, Darwin. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for spending extra time with everyone tonight, and I uh, apologize uh, to you. Paul and Ozzy Bloke and anyone else that has some questions out there that we didn't get to. Um, I will go through the chat here and get your questions written down for next week. And please join us 
again next week and uh 